All right, hello everyone. Uh, we're gonna get going very, very shortly. Uh, again, thank you for joining us today. We've got a, a lot to uh, present today. So maybe I'll just start with, uh, with the introductions as, as many of you are starting to log on. Uh, we do have a lot of people joining us today. Uh, you will be muted. Just a, a quick reminder that uh, these webinars will be recorded and they will be on the CBMA's COVID-19 uh, webpage. So you will be able to uh, have friends and colleagues continuously log in and, and watch the webinar uh, if they're unable to attend. So uh, good morning to all of those of you in the West and uh, good afternoon for uh, all of those of you in the East Coast. My name is Dr. Ian Sandler and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Grey Wolf Animal Health. We're a Canadian specialty animal health company. And I also sit on the National Issues Committee of the Canadian Veterinary Medical Association. And it's uh, with great pride uh, that we are able to have Dr. Gordon Arbus join us today. Uh, Dr. Ar Arbus is really uh, a pioneer in his field. He, um, he holds many positions, both with the University of Toronto at St. Michael's Hospital, but he is the uh, clinical, clinical director of the HIV AIDS program and uh, his outreach services really make a, a huge difference in many lives of Torontonians every day. Uh, he's worked in, in many different uh, academic areas and has training uh, in all sorts of uh, areas of human health, uh, especially in, in the area of infectious disease. So uh, Dr. Arbus, uh, welcome. Thank you so much, Ian. And thank you for the introduction. Uh, and really, thank you for inviting me. It's always a pleasure to speak to a group of intelligent uh, docs, and this time it's veterinarians. So uh, it's, it's a real privilege uh, to speak with you today. Um, well, it's great. It's great to have you. And I, and I will say this before we start, you know, when veterinarians um, go to vet school or, or when students become, uh, you know, veterinary students, we know that we may get kicked, we may get bitten. And certainly I know that, that, that human MDs take on all sorts of responsibilities. If you're a surgeon and you're operating on an HIV patient or somebody with hep C, there's, there's inherent risk. But I will say this, uh, COVID-19 has put uh, healthcare workers in the level of risk that I, I don't think anyone could ever imagine. And the fact that uh, you and your teammates have responded in, in the way that you have is just remarkable. And so on behalf of you know, the hundreds of, of veterinarians on the line today, thank you for, for all that you guys do. It, it's really thank, quite remarkable. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's a whole new world. And so we'll talk about that. And I know you guys as veterinarians are also, your lives have been turned upside down as well. So we'll talk about the commitment that, that you're putting forth in terms of working with your clients and with your with your animals and, and, and their owners. Um, there's some challenges that we'll talk about. And uh, so what I'm hoping to do is do an overview um, sort of briefly, and then hopefully we'll have time for a good discussion and questions. Um, I wanted to just talk briefly about transmission. Um, and I'm gonna say right off the bat that a lot of what we're learning is changing day by day. And so we still don't really have a good understanding of some of the basics of this virus. We don't really have a complete understanding of transmission and how this virus is transmitted. We're learning more about that every day. I'm going to talk a little bit about clinical presentation and how that can vary also between adults and children. A little bit about epidemiology, especially locally here in Ontario and Toronto. Um, I'm a primary care physician, so I'm going to talk a little bit about my experiences on the front line um, and how our work has changed over the last two, three months. Uh, I'm going to talk briefly about treatment. Um, some vaccine development issues. And I think a really interesting discussion is what is our lives professionally and, and socially uh, and you know, spiritually gonna look like on, on all those levels of what will the future look like in those domains. Um, I always like uh, invoking a little bit of humor in my talks. Um, and so I often see dogs you know, with these cones, which I know when you do a procedure or something, you, you have the dog wear that. And, they're not supposed to lick their face or touch their face. And so this is just the dog telling us not to touch our faces. And that's been a big theme um, through this is, is really do not touch your face, don't touch your eyes, don't touch your nose. And I know if you have children, you're probably really tired about reminding them not to do that and reminding ourselves not to do that. Um, and, and really, I think there's a lot of superheroes out there. Um, it's not just physicians and nurses and, and, and healthcare workers, but it's veterinarians like yourselves. It's people who are working in the grocery store, you know, to, at the cashier, um, people who are working in, you know, mechanics, um, garbage, uh, garbage sanitation engineers, um, all kinds of people who are having to work every single day because they can't really be working from home and they can't afford not to be working. So we have to acknowledge those people right off the bat. 
Um, so transmission we know is of uh, this virus is largely by close person to person transmission. Generally it's by respiratory droplets and by fomites. So touch surfaces, um, things that, you know, frequent touch surfaces like door handles, um, ha handrails, um, TTC or bus handles. Uh, the virus is found in respiratory secretions and saliva. Now the tricky thing with this virus is that viral shedding by asymptomatic people may represent uh, up to half of total infections. And in some studies, the thinking is that it might even be more. So this is a big problem is that people are shedding virus when they may not have symptoms yet or may not have symptoms at all. And the viral shedding may, uh, may predate the symptoms by one to two days. And viral titers are actually highest in this earlier, earliest phase of infection. Um, there's some thinking that aerosolized spread could occur, um, but this is thought to be mostly in hospital settings. Um, so this is why when people are doing procedures in the hospital and there's been all kinds of controversy, initially we were told, you know, maybe we needed N95 masks, but generally we're using surgical masks unless we're doing uh, procedures where there's a higher risk of aerosolized spread. So intubation, um, bronchoscopy, uh, performing CPR, and in those cases, there's a much higher risk of aerosolized spread. And in those in instances, we would be wearing N95 masks. Um, and to date, there has not been a well-documented outbreak traced to aerosolized transmission, for example, through HVAC systems or airplanes. Now, again, that might change in the next you know, little while, but so to date, that has not been the case. Um, and so we know that we can prevent transmission in healthcare settings. And this is what we've been spending a lot of our time doing in our clinic. Uh, we are still seeing people at, at obviously at the hospital and the emergency room in our clinics, but really the, the numbers are way down. And in our primary care setting, we're instructed to basically see patients only on an essential basis. So I would be working five days a week, at least in person seeing patients. Now I'm basically only allowed to work one day a week. Um, so before people arrive, we do a lot of screening over the telephone um, to kind of screen to ensure that they don't have any symptoms or high risk. Um, and then when they arrive, um, we have a lot of visual alerts. We have a lot of supplies on hand. Um, that sometimes go, they disappear in terms of uh, hand hygiene, uh, so sanitizer, um, providing masks to patients. Um, we have a, a screening tool that we utilize when people come into the clinic. And then immediately we physically separate people from others. So if they need to be in a waiting room situation, we have uh, the chairs in the waiting room, they're distance six uh, feet apart uh, at minimum. And what we try and do is we keep people ideally not in the waiting room, but we try and put them directly in a room if we can, especially if they have symptoms. Um, and what we do is if we put them in an isolation room, we ensure that the room is closed, the door is closed. Um, and what we do is we limit visitors. Um, and, and so sometimes that's very challenging. Uh, if someone has a personal support worker that they need to have uh, or that they count on, or if we have a child obviously that needs to be with a parent, we allow them into the room as well. But we really try and limit visitors uh, or, or people who are accompanying the patient into the room. And we also limit staff who enter the room. So what I might have done in the past, you know, I would have done one thing and the nurse would have come in and finished the job to do an immunization. Generally what we do is we try and have just one person see that patient um, so that we have as few people um, seeing the patient as possible. We're a teaching hospital, so that pre presents some problems for our learners. Um, medical students haven't really been allowed back into the clinic. Uh, residents, we have them lim with a limited role, um, generally doing more telemedicine rather than in-person medicine. So it's changed things for a lot of people. Dr. Arbus, can I ask you just a quick question? You mentioned the screening tool. Um, is that a combination of a questionnaire and a temperature check? Like, can you just get into maybe a little more detail of what that is? And if it is like a one-page document, I'm wondering if, if you can maybe share that with us. Yeah, so it, it, it's evolved over time. And so initially, the focus of these questions was very much on travel. You know, have you traveled to China was the initial question, and then do you have any travel? Now the travel is sort of a lesser question, but, you know, it's the question of, um, do you have shortness of breath? Uh, do you have fever? Do you have cough? Uh, have you been exposed to anybody who uh, has tested positive for COVID? It's the same questions that I get asked every time I come into our hospital each day. Um, and so now, as for staff, there's an app that we can just answer the questions and just flash the uh, barcode as we enter the hospital. Um, but we have to every day indicate no to these questions. So it's really a, up to every individual to make sure that we're being honest in these you know, 
in these answers, right? And, and that presents a lot of tr challenges for people who, let's say, need to work, right? Or need want to come in and get something done. Sometimes people don't tell the truth, right? And so we're counting on people being able to tell the truth in answering these questions. Uh, as staff entering the hospital or healthcare facility, we don't get our temperature done. Um, and we're not doing that uh, routinely if someone subjectively says they don't have a fever. Um, okay. But we do have um, screening staff um, at, at the front door of our clinic, for example, dressed in full PPE with an O2 sat and, and, and uh, temperature uh, thermometer in, in case they need to use that. So, but all these things have changed. All these protocols have changed over time. Um, and so we know that in a healthcare setting, we can use proper hand hygiene. We have um, a, an environmental cleaning staff, at least in our hospital, that comes um, in the middle of the day to clean the room to get ready for the afternoon. So before, we used to just run the clinic all day. And now what's happened is we have a one-hour break where we're not seeing patients so that the cleaning staff can come in and disinfect the, each of the rooms. Um, we have personal protective equipment um, for, for um, our pr providers, um, masks and eye protection, um, and uh, the contact precautions. We have gowns and gloves. And again, if there's anything what, that we're doing that produces an aerosolized, which we really don't do in our primary care setting, we have uh, N95 respirators, but we really reserve those only for those situations. Um, and Dr. Arbus, are you finding that um, with some of the shortages that you're seeing, and I know PPE, there was a major shipment that came in today uh, into the Vancouver area. Um, are, you, are you sort of reutilizing PPE? Because this is obviously a big issue for us. Uh, many veterinarians have donated their PPE to healthcare centers and we're you know, operating on um, you know, some product. And there's more product coming in, but you know, obviously veterinarians are concerned that as they ramp up with surgeries and certainly dental procedures that some of this equipment may need to be reused. And so are you seeing some uh, reusement, if you will? Is that a word? Yes, uh, we, reusement we are. So initially it was, there was so much flux of what was going on. We were told each day when we came in, we could only get one surgical mask. And someone said, well, what if you have, you know, eat something at lunch, what do you do with your mask? And you were told to put it on a paper towel. It was very stressful, you know, because here we were in the front lines in the midst of all this, and we were being told, don't use too much PPE. In the last few weeks, the feeling I'm getting is that uh, we have, a, seem to have an adequate supply of PPE. And I know a lot of hospitals across the country have inventory tools so that we can keep track of how much we're using and how much is available to us. Our hospital is guaranteed that we would be, continue to keep using uh, PPE and have it at our disposal. Um, right now, what we're doing is um, at the um, COVID assessment center where I work, we're starting to use washable uh, gowns. Um, so uh, just to explain, when I do screening at the COVID center and doing a swab, we have to change our PPE with each patient that we see. And the testing, for example, on the Sunday when I was there, when our premier indicated everyone should get a test, the numbers have actually gone up dramatically in terms of people requesting a test, which is good. But that means that we're going to burn through a lot of PPE. So the face visor that we use, we're reutilizing and, and we're washing it at the end of our shift. Uh, and then we, we put it in a, like a little locker so that we can use it for our next shift. So our face masks are being reused. Um, our gowns, some are disposable and some are being reused and put into a, hand, a laundry hamper and washed. Um, you know, gloves we change with, with each patient. And again, the N95 mask uh, is really only preserved for, for aerosolized procedures. And then the surgical masks, we're being told we can use two a day. We, we, we were given two when we walk into the hospital now instead of one. So there's, that's also caused a lot of anxiety is the supply of PPE and whether, you know, we're being told there are mixed messages. But I think that's gotten better. Um, and thanks to, you know, dentists and veterinarians like who early on really gave a, a lot of their supply, um, you know, and, and now they're going to be in a situation where they may have trouble accessing PPE. So it, it's a huge issue for a lot of people. So just, you know, you're probably aware of the symptoms of COVID. Um, and so, you know, primarily we hear about the classic ones of cough, or, cough fever, chills, uh, muscle ache, shortness of breath. Uh, anosmia or loss of taste or smell is, is, is one that's very interesting that that's kind of come uh, more recently. And, and symptoms, again, can range from very mild uh, or sort of very minimal symptoms to severe illness, uh, as we know. And um, managing people over the phone with, through telemedicine has made this very challenging. 
And so I'm just going to identify some risk factors of who, which people we look out for and which people we know get very sick potentially with this virus. And so we know that people over age 65 um, are at highest risk, uh, especially those who live in long-term care facilities, uh, nursing homes. And this has been a, a real disaster in, in BC and in Ontario and Quebec, especially uh, where the majority of cases where people get quite ill and die have been in nursing homes. And you've probably seen in the news the, the sort of horrors of, of the conditions in some of these places and how they didn't have access to PPE. You know, I, I, I'm very blessed where I work. I do have good access to PPE, but for a lot of the people who are working in these nursing homes, they did not have good access to PPE. They were making very minimal uh, wage working there. And a lot of those people got sick early on or just got burnt out and that didn't come to work. Um, so, so that's the, the people that we worry most about in terms of who gets sick. And we know that there's certain underlying conditions that generally are associated with aging that are worrisome, right? So high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, uh, chronic uh, COPD, uh, respiratory issues, cancers, uh, chronic kidney disease. And we're also seeing obesity. So in the United States, there's some good data showing that younger people are also getting quite sick with this. They tend to be obese and they also tend to be visible minority whether they be Hispanic or African American in the United States. So it seems to be like a lot of viruses, and I work in the area of HIV, it seems to attack the most vulnerable populations, you know, our, our older people, people with chronic medical conditions, and um, also people living in conditions that aren't ideal, like nursing homes or shelters, um, or, you know, underhoused in, in inadequate housing. And so sometimes what we're seeing when people do get sick, um, it's generally respiratory disease that they're suffering from, but we're learning more about other things that are happening like cardiac manifestations, neurologic manifestations like stroke, uh, thrombotic events, um, pulmonary embolus, uh, DVT. And so these are some of the um, lab parameters that we're noticing. Um, so generally you're gonna see abnormalities on chest X-ray and CT scan. Uh, you may have white blood cell and lymphocyte abnormalities. Uh, platelets may be affected. You might get elevations in LDH, uh, elevations in liver enzymes. And then later on, as people get really sick, you get elevations of, of inflammatory markers like interleukin-6 and D-dimer and C-reactive protein. So when those things start to happen, that, that's a very bad sign. Um, and you're also getting coagulopathies as well, which is... Uh, so, and each day, I think we're learning more about some of these odd presentations. Uh, initially, it was thought to mainly be a respiratory disease, but we're realizing that it's affecting the body uh, in multiple systems. And so, you know, people, uh, we know that about 80 to 90% of cases may not be severe, um, and many of those cases will be asymptomatic, but of the ones that are getting sick, um, they're basically experiencing septic shock, ARDS, this sort of inflammatory storm, a cytokine storm. Uh, they develop acute kidney injury and renal failure. Um, and then a lot of patients, again, are developing this hypercoagulable state where people are getting a deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolus, strokes, um, heart attacks. And of course, unfortunately, many, many people around the world are dying with this. Um, and then interestingly enough, people were th thinking, well, kids don't generally get sick with this. And that's generally been the rule that children, for whatever reason, are asymptomatic. And uh, that is a good thing, but it's also a bad thing because they're likely spreading the infection, um, not knowing that they are carriers to this virus, and they might be spreading it within their household. Um, but there's been a more interesting uh, presentation of this pediatric multisystem inflammatory syndrome. Uh, that seems to be tempor temporarily associated with COVID. Um, so this is a child that will present with a, sort of a Kawasaki disease-like uh, picture where they're getting a fever, uh, rash, um, and then they're de developing like toxic shock or, or, or GI or neurological manifestations. Um, and this is something that's not very common, but it is something that we're seeing. And in the US, there's been some cases and in Italy of deaths in children uh, related to this syndrome. So in Canada so far, it is, there's just a sort of a, a warning out to look for this in the pediatric community, um, but I don't think there's been huge numbers of people being hospitalized with this to my knowledge, uh, although that likely will change. And so if you look at the number of cases, and this is just in Ontario, um, so I apologize that I'm just speaking about Ontario right now. So we can see that, you know, out of the cases that are happening, um, that the majority of deaths um, that are happening are in the long-term care home uh, facilities. 
and um, you know it's affecting people who who are living in those facilities and unfortunately it's also impacting healthcare workers who've been working in those facilities and so I just put this slide up there to really again note that um, elderly people living in these facilities are the ones who face the brunt of, of the uh, burden of this disease and the, and the mortality with, with the virus. And uh, this is again just showing you out of the 26,000 deaths reported in Ontario, or sorry, that out of the 26,000 cases in Ontario, um, there's been approximately 2,100 deaths. Uh, and you can see that the propensity of the deaths or the reported deaths are generally in those 80 and over. And so the case mortality rate is quite high in these patients. So if you're over 80 and you, you know, test positive for COVID, you have quite a high chance of, of dying with this disease. Um, Dr. Arbus, a couple of quick questions. Sure. Um, in terms of the number of individuals that have died, and, and you may not have the, the details, but, but do you think that those are primarily respiratory, that the majority are, are respiratory and the rest are these secondary sequelae or syndromes that happen as a result of the cytokine storm? Like, do you have an idea, you know, primarily within the adult population of the number of individuals are dying? Is it purely a respiratory issue or primarily, a majority, a combination of both? Yeah, it's primarily a resp respiratory issue where, you know, these patients end up getting intubated and they die of respiratory failure. But with that will come some of these other manifestations. So I had a patient who was 75 with HIV, diabetes, COPD, and he ended up in the ICU intubated and then he had a massive stroke. Um, and so the, the stroke I think is sort of, was related to this inflammation and, and hypercoagulable state that, that sort of was a secondary complication I think of a primary respiratory disease, yeah. So, so this, this slide is just basically showing you that, again, the, it's the over 80 population, if you're going to get this, they face the brunt of, of, of this and are, are representing most of the deaths in, in most of the provinces. Um, so I just wanted to give you my perspective in terms of the frontline sort of primary perspective. Um, we've generally been avoiding seeing patients in person um, just because that's been mandated um, by the province. Um, that's caused obviously some challenges for us. So the reason for that was to preserve PPE to prevent transmission of patients who are coming to see us. We know that's led to cancellation of elective surgeries and, and, and procedures. Um, I think we scared the crap out of a lot of people initially and, and people have not been going to the emergency rooms and managing people over the phone is, is challenging because you're, you, know, it's, uh, you express concern to someone and you're like, I need to see you or I, I think you should go to the emergency room, you're experiencing chest pain, you have known coronary disease and like, no, I don't wanna go there, I don't wanna catch COVID. And so there's been some negative outcomes managing people who just say, I wanna stay at home. Um, and so managing people over the telephone or on telemedicine and, and we're using a, a, a platform called OTN here in Ontario, which works quite well. But I think for people to be able to use that, they have to be able to have a phone, they have to be able to have internet, um, they have to be able to have a computer that has a camera, and it sounds funny, but a lot of people don't have those things. And so there's some limitations in trying to communicate with people, and we can only manage certain things over the telephone or video. You know, there's things that we just need to lay our hands on people and see them in person. Um, and uh, so there's pressure sometimes to not see these patients unless we really have to. And Dr. Arbus, there's, a, there's an old saying in veterinary medicine that a good exam and an excellent history will ultimately lead to a diagnosis in 95% of the time. So, you know, ultimately with telemedicine, we're relying more on that history. And ideally, if there's a patient-client relationship that has been previously established, if we know, you know, previous medical history of, of, of the patient, it helps. But, but what hasn't worked with telemedicine or, or what's missing from, from your perspective? And it's probably very similar to us. I mean, veterinarians are ultimately pediatricians. Um, you know, our patients can't talk to us, but um, you know, looking at lesions, having a feel, trying to, you know, to identify size uh, or touch is, is very, very important. So are, are you seeing the same kind of limitations with telemedicine on your end? Yeah, I, I would tend to agree. There's certain things you just need to eyeball um, you know, I think abdominal pain is a really tricky one um, to, to, you know, you really want to lay your hands on the patient. There's certain, certain derm things that we get, you know, uh, emailed photos or on the video, but sometimes you can't see the resolution's not great. You can't really make out what's going on. 
And then there's simply uh, mental health issues that people either don't trust the technology or don't know how to use the technology. And those are the same people that are very vulnerable from a mental health perspective. We have a lot of issues with uh, managing our patients with addiction. Um, and that's, you know, because a lot of those patients don't have addresses or phones. And so we're trying to manage, you know, methadone management and suboxone treatment. It, there's been some real challenges. I would say that there's some positive things using telemedicine. And I think things like diabetes follow up, chronic disease management follow up. You know, I get patients to weigh themselves. I get patients to check their own blood pressures now. And that way I can try and manage some of these chronic diseases. Um, and even my HIV patients who are stable, the telemedicine's gone quite well. Um, so redeployment, a lot of us have had to move to other places to help where the needs are. And so I've been working at the COVID assessment center where we screen people um, for COVID and uh, we, we do testing. Um, and that's been, you know, some, sometimes it's quite busy and other times it's really not busy at all. And so I'm encouraged by the fact that in the last week we've had a real uptick in terms of the number of tests that we're doing because I think that's the key in moving forward is doing more testing so we have an understanding of what's going on, especially if a lot of patients are asymptomatic. Um, some of us have been working in the low acuity emergency room because uh, the eMERGE docs were sort of um, asked to, to manage more of the COVID cases. That's also been very quiet. And I've been working at shelters doing screening. So I was there this morning at the Salvation Army uh, screening because there's, that's another really bad situation where a lot of people in shelters have tested positive and trying to find where those patients are going to stay uh, until they clear their virus. And that's been a real challenge. Um, the limitations of PPE, as I was saying earlier, some days it feels like we have a good supply and then we're told, you know, the supply is running short. And so there's always that anxiety hanging over our head. Uh, testing, uh, I think that we're not doing enough testing. Um, and then the, some challenges with isolation. So I have a family that I'm managing over the telephone. There are five people living in a one bedroom apartment, uh, immigrants from Ethiopia. And uh, first the child got it, was completely asymptomatic, and then the mom got it. And then unfortunately the grandmother who's living with them ended up with this as well uh, and ended up in the ICU, although she's recovering, I believe. So that's good. But you know, there's challenges with telling people to isolate if they have one bathroom and one bedroom in their apartment. You know, we take for granted that to isolate means that they can be apart from the other people living in their family. And sometimes that's very challenging. Um, one big theme that's happening is patients are fearing coming to the clinic. So I spend a lot of time on the phone saying, I, you know, I got to see you, I got to see you. They really don't want to come in. Um, and uh, some people are being dying at home. Uh, some people are presenting late to the emergency room, vital signs absent. And some people are developing strokes and heart attacks, ruptured appendix. These have all happened in my uh, patients. Um, and then what I really worry about is the fallout of, of what's happened these last two, three months in that certain things that you know people have medical problems aren't being looked after so uh, certain you know certain conditions aren't being managed or aren't being diagnosed um and, you know cancers are being missed um say surgeries are being canceled um so people with the you know bad hip arthritis are supposed to have a total hip replacement they can't move around they're not happy that can't be helpful and so i think it's having a big um impact on people's physical health but also on their mental health we know that everything that has gone on has caused some psychological stress in terms of people losing jobs, um, people losing their businesses, uh, feeling socially isolated, not being able to see family and loved ones. So I, I think that's a big toll that we're, we're going to see the follow-up from that in the next number of months. Dr. Orvis, could you <clears throat> maybe um, just briefly talk about <clears throat> the response at a hospital level? Because I know in Toronto, um, for example, I, I believe Humber is one of the centers, uh, you know, seeing COVID patients, with, at least within the ICUs, whereas some other hospitals that you would think would be kind of inundated with these cases or inundated with these cases are not. So, for example, Mount Sinai has not been doing routine procedures, but they really haven't been very busy. Right. Um, the same with, with Sunnybrook. So can you talk about what you've actually seen on the ground vis-a-vis -vis even things like ventilators? I know the CBMA was very active in working with uh, veterinary specialists to try and procure um, Drager primarily ventilators into the into the human market for you know for acute use and and luckily I, I don't think many of them have actually had to be used so can you just talk a little bit about what you've seen on the field with respect to kind of how many cases are actually getting hospitalized because I know people see images of, of New York and 
I mean, yeah. I've been I've been to conferences at the at the COVID center, and and you know, to see these hospital beds look like a mass unit is just almost inconceivable. So, can you just talk a little bit about what's happening in? And I know it's just Toronto, but but what's happening vis-a-vis -vis the hospital um, capabilities well, think, at this point? I mean, listen, I think what we wanted to do, and uh, I don't blame anybody for this, but we wanted to prevent what was going on in Italy. And in New York, right, in terms of where the hospitals were completely inundated, there was shortages of beds, shortage of ICU beds, shortage of ventilators. And so I think the provinces decided we can't let that happen. And with all the restrictions in terms of people, you know, staying at home and quarantine, the idea was to flatten the curve and, and to prevent the surge in, in admissions. And I think we achieved that. Um, so even though our hospital opened, we have a whole new uh, building that just opened in time for COVID, specifically open prematurely, they opened two or three floors as of COVID wards. And what ended up happening is those beds generally weren't filled. So, you know, and what we needed to do pre to prepare was to cancel surgeries, um, close beds. Um, and what happened was those beds weren't filled. Uh, the, you know, the ICU was not as bombarded as people thought. Um, so that's a good thing, but I, what I'm saying is now we're, we're really going to see the follow of all these delayed surgeries and all these procedures and patient visits that have been postponed. And um, I know that there's a, a sort of a ramp up plan that's happening for all the hospitals, but it's very slow. And there's certain conditions that need to be met before things open up in terms of surgical procedures or other procedures or even patient visits. So they have to ensure that there's adequate supplies of PPE. They have to ensure that, that there's certain beds um, made available for COVID patients. So it's a juggling act. And, and I think it's been very, very tricky. Um, but the bottom line is hospitals, even in a major urban center like Toronto, were not inundated um, in terms of ICU admissions and you know, potential shortage of ventilators. So that's good. Um, but I think maybe we overshot the mark a little bit and we're gonna, it's gonna take some time to repair the damage of, of, of all the things that have been delayed. Do you have an idea of when, you know, barring a second or third wave, do you have an idea of where you know, St. Mike's will be in the next three to six months with respect to capacity? Is it 50%, 80%, uh, I, where, where do you think you're gonna end? I believe, I just saw the document and it's not, uh, it's not public yet, this document, it's just a working document, but I believe it's 30% by September and 50% by Christmas. So that's to me very concerning that I, I'm going to be working still, you know, 50% capacity seeing my patients in six months from now. You know, that's very concerning. But I think really until we have a proper vaccine, I don't really see a positive way out of this in terms of, you know, all the things that we're going to keep having to do, the physical distancing, uh, the PPE use, all of it, right? And so it's, it's a little disheartening to know, you know, because I, I thought initially, you know, by now things would be kind of changing, right? And I think we see that by the end of the year, we're not going to have huge differences in how we manage our patients and how we look after people and pets. Um, so this is just me at, at one of the shelters at Seton House Shelter. And, and uh, you know, who would have thought I'd be wearing a hazmat suit, uh, you know, a couple of months ago. Um, but uh, it's quite rewarding work to go into these shelters and try and identify cases. And, and unfortunately, a lot of the staff have tested positive as well. And so it's a challenge to find places for these people to go. And a lot of the hotels in the city have opened up, and that's where a lot of these people will stay until they recover from their infection. Um, so the treatment, you know, there isn't a whole lot to say. Um, to date, there's really no specific drug or drug combo with proven efficacy against coronavirus. The mainstay is supportive treatment, including advanced organ support for patients with severe disease. Um, and there's all kinds of clinical trials going on to look at treatments that we've used in the past that we've heard about and some newer therapies as well. Um, and so, you know, bottom line is, you know, there's some evidence obviously that certain antivirals will work. So you've probably heard about remdesivir, um, which was initially, you know, put together for, for Ebola. Um, and this is a treatment that's really being investigated only for those most acutely ill patients who are generally on, on ventilators. Um, and uh, it's not approved by the FDA, but it is approved for emergency authorization. So a lot of patients who are getting it here in Toronto have been uh, applications for emergency use. Um, there's clinical trials going on, and there was a, a good publication in the New England Journal showing that um, there is likely some efficacy in terms of fewer deaths and shortening the course of the infection. That's generally been utilized, again, 
um, for, for severe disease. And so it's not recommended for the treatment of mild or moderate COVID. Um, and uh, so, so that I think is one of the more promising treatments. Um, you've heard a lot in the news with, about chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. So these are drugs that we've used in the past for malaria and, and that are being used for patients who have lupus or rheumatoid arthritis. And bottom line, I'm not going to get into the details, but the, the World Health Organization just came out uh, based on a Lancet publication to say that it seems to be doing more harm than good um, in, in uh, patients. And uh, the recommendation from the NIH is to recommend against using uh, chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine, um, and also to recommend against um, the use of hydroxychloroquine plus azithromycin. Um, so, and, and I know President Trump, I don't want to get political, but I know Trump you know, said he was taking it for prophylaxis and, and uh, he sort of indicated that people should be taking it. We know that the, these are dangerous drugs, right? There's cardiac toxicity in terms of uh, uh, arrhythmias um, and, and death. And so um, I've had a lot of phone calls, at least in the first few weeks saying, should I take it? Should I take it as prophylaxis? And I don't think that there's any evidence that we should be doing that, but I think more data needs to be seen. So I don't want to get too, political about it. Um, lopinavir ritonavir is an HIV drug that I've used, uh, prescribed for many years, uh, called Calitra. Uh, they're protease inhibitors. Also, probably, uh, there's some ongoing studies looking at it, but so far from the data I've seen, it isn't all that helpful. Um, and then there's immune-based therapies. So you've heard about uh, uh, the use of immune globulin. You may have heard, heard about co covalescent uh, plasma, so people who, who've been gotten ill with this disease and then using their plasma to treat patients. Um, and so far, you know, the recommendations are, are that there isn't enough evidence to be using this, um, except for in the clinical con in the context of a clinical trial. Um, and because of the cytokine storm I was talking about earlier, you know, development of sort of people getting huge storms of, of cytokines and interleukin-6, there are certain uh, agents that, that are being touted. Um, uh, interleukin-6 inhibitors, for example, um, and there's insufficient data to recommend either for or against using those for right now. So um, not to sound negative, but I think that it's too early to kind of recommend one treatment, and I think the trials are ongoing. Um, so are you guys actually utilizing plasma therapy now, and, and is public health uh, connecting with, with um, you know, recovered COVID patients to harvest plasma? I know there's trials going on, and, and so I think, I can't remember, I think it's in Hamilton at McMaster where there's a trial, but I wouldn't say it's sort of prime time being used okay. in, in the clinical setting. I would say the, the one agent I am familiar with being used is remdesivir, um, which is probably the, the one that's been most accessed through all of this. Um, otherwise, it's generally, and I know that some of my colleagues are looking at lipinavir, ritonavir, or Coletra uh, in a clinical trial. Um, so. Yeah, I, 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 I can't say more than that because I don't think the data is really out there just yet. And similarly, you know, people ask about vaccines and we know that there's over 100 candidates in development. Um, we know there's going to be manufacturing and distribution challenges, right? So even if they find a vaccine that's efficacious, you have to ramp up production and have the capacity to potentially produce millions and millions of doses. So I think it's going to be a group effort. I think there's going to be a few different candidates that will be hopefully effective. And it's going to end up with a regional war potentially, right? Where, you know, United States, if Moderna is one of the companies, you know, if their vaccine is, is found to be efficacious and they're ramping up production, the president might say, we can only get provided to our own, you know, citizens before we import it to other countries. Um, so, you know, and then the question is, well, how will we prior prioritize the vaccine? Um, I think obviously frontline workers will be sort of first to, to get it. Uh, I think the elderly and people with major chronic conditions will be next. Um, but, you, you know, there's going to be hundreds of millions of people or billions of people who really will, will need this vaccine. And then the question is, even if it is efficacious, will they offer like fully protective immunity? Uh, and it will be something that we can sort of eradicate like smallpox? Or will it be more similar to influenza where you get some, you know, waxing, waning immunity um, and, you know, you might get a, a case of COVID if you're vaccinated, but it may not be as severe. Uh, so you may not have, you know, might prevent hospitalizations, for example. So it's a, it, there's a lot of questions uh, to, to, to ask. Um, and, and this is just the list of, of, of some of the vaccines. 
Um, so luckily at Dalhousie University, uh, Canada has a candidate together with a Chinese company. Um, Moderna is a company out of Boston that came up with a good, some good initial data. Uh, Novovax, if you're following that, was another one that just came out. Inovio, uh, Oxford University in the UK. Um, so these are, are vaccines that some are based on very old platforms in terms of inactivated virus, and some are, are newer technologies like the Moderna one, which I believe is an engineered uh, RNA uh, technology. Um, and so, you know, these vaccines take time to develop, right? So you keep hearing 12 to 18 months. Um, I think that the reading I've done in the last few days, people aren't as optimistic about that time frame. Um, so, you know, even if you have a candidate in 12 months or six to 12 months, it'll probably be at least 18 months until it's rolled out to get out to, to people who, who need it. So, um, so the next topic I just wanted to speak about was sort of how we do, how do we move forward? You know, I think that we've all been in sort of lockdown for the last couple of months and people are getting restless and we're social beings. And, uh, if you live in Toronto, you saw last weekend. Um, there was, you know, literally thousands of people packed into a park. So obviously people there were not practicing physical distancing. Um, young people feel that they're not vulnerable, right? And, and they generally don't feel vulnerable about anything. So they were the ones who were at the park because they figure if I get it, big deal, I'm not going to get sick. Um, but the issue is who are they going to go hang out with? You know, are they going to go see their grandparents or their parents or people who have chronic conditions? And that's the worrisome thing. Um, the other thing that's been disappointing is the number of tests have really been low, uh, especially in a province like Ontario. Um, and it's only in the last few days with the premier saying, listen, if you want to test, everyone should be able to get a test, even if you don't have symptoms. So I think now we're starting to see people getting tested. And I think it's only when we see people getting tested that we'll have an understanding of who has this infection, what's the prevalence in the community, and then we can hopefully do proper contact tracing and isolate people and, and therefore prevent, you know, mass spread of, of, of the virus. Um, and there's a lot of people saying, you know, this is a hoax. And, and when you have political leaders saying, you know, like in Brazil or United States saying this is not, it's just a little fluke, you need strong leadership. And unfortunately, Brazil now is number two behind the United States. And I think Russia is number three. So this becomes a political thing and, and it becomes very frightening. Uh, when governments don't don't take this seriously. Dr. Arbus, can I ask you a couple of questions just around this idea of, of screening tools and contact tracing? So let's talk about, you know, the next six months. I think most people are concerned that, <clears throat> yes, we've, we, you know, we've been able to flatten the curve. In some provinces, they haven't seen cases in a few days or even a few weeks. But the issue becomes once international borders open, uh, you know, be it international, U.S. or, or both, um, you know, how do we really um, prevent that second or third wave from really spiking? Some projections have, you know, the number of cases moving up in Ontario, for example, to like a thousand, and I think we're at two or three hundred right now. Yeah. So I guess my question to you is: I know U of T has been doing some work around an antibody uh, test or possibly treatment for, you know, for for some of the clinical trials happening. What do you think is going to happen, like? For example, for you guys who are really in the highest risk and maybe dentists, I would think once they open up as well, are you gonna be getting tested every two weeks? And, and what does that look like? What does the new norm look like for the next six to 12 months until you know, a vaccine becomes apparent? Because I think all of us realize our waiting wounds are gonna be reduced, you know, client visits are gonna be reduced, um, you know, all of the things, uh, you know, PPE and, and, and social distancing, that's going to continue. I don't think any, anybody's questioning that, but I think people are trying to understand, you know, what, what is, what does the safety look like? Well, I think, I mean, that's the holy grail of that question, right? I think ultimately for people who can work at home, they're going to continue to work at home. For those people who need to be out and about because they work on the transit system or in healthcare facilities or in the construction business, I think what you'll see is employers um, providing uh, quick testing uh, in these settings so that people can get tested frequently. Um, and, you know, there'll be some point of care technologies that will be developed uh, hopefully soon. The antibody tests are really uh, very challenging because to date, uh, they haven't really panned out very well. They're not very accurate. 50% at best, is that what they're saying? Yeah, and, and I think the question is, you know, just because you test positive on a serology test, on an antibody test, 
how long are you really protected? You know, and, and I know there's been cases in, in South Korea where people have gotten infected again. Um, and I think ultimately what it comes down to is we're going to continue to need to practice all these measures, right? Hand washing, physical distancing, uh, people wearing face coverings when they're out and about. Um, you know, and if you look at countries like Singapore and, and South Korea, they've really done a good job with aggressive testing, uh, aggressive contact tracing, the use of technology, you know, certain apps, which I know scares a lot of people because of privacy concerns. But, you know, countries like Taiwan, South Korea, Singapore, they've really done a great job identifying who these people are and making sure that people who they've been in contact with get tested and, and isolated as well. So it's going to be challenging, right? Because doing adequate contact tracing requires a lot of energy, a lot of money, a lot of manpower. And so far, I haven't seen the will in our government to kind of get that off the ground. Um, yeah, it'll have to be a federal mandate for sure. I think something's going to have to happen because, uh, you know, again, for those people who can remain at home and work at home, I, I don't think it's as concerning for them. But most of the working people that I see in my practice, they need to be out in public. And they're the ones who are highest risk and they're the most vulnerable because of their health and economic situation. So it's really, um, there's a lot of challenges. Um, and, and this is, you know, the slide that's up here now is basically showing, you know, people are getting bored and I have teenagers and, you know, you do too, Ian, I know, and, and they're getting restless. And so I think what I'm trying to do is do a little harm reduction with my patients and with my family to say, listen, you know, the weather's good. Have a couple of friends over in the backyard. I think, you know, that's the lowest risk. You know, if you want to go for a jog or bike ride, I think that's lowest risk. You know, but when you start meeting indoors, and we know that a lot of the cases that have happened, a lot of the outbreaks are in churches, um, choir practices, uh, discos, and, you know, nightclubs. I think those are the places that we need to have people avoid as much as possible. Large gatherings in small settings, right? Uh, in, in, in small indoor places. I think being outdoors seems to be associated with less risk. And, you know, someone used the analogy of, you, you know, if you let out a fart, in a small little room, you know, you would, you would smell the fart more than if you're in a large field, right? Uh, more distant from other people. So it's the same analogy. And uh, I think really, um, we're going to be the recommendation now, and it took a while is to wear face coverings. I recommend that to people, especially if they're not going to be able to maintain a six feet distance. And even the question of this six feet, you know, is that really, maybe it needs to be more you know, especially if you're in an indoor place. Um, I think if you're going for a bike ride and jogging, there's some evidence that these droplets might be passed on even with a greater distance. And so sometimes when people ask me, you know, should I be jogging more than six feet or biking more than six feet? Probably yes. Um, and then just some common sense things, washing your hands, you know, um, staying home, obviously, if you're, if you're unwell, um, avoiding shared surfaces. Um, like in playgrounds or, or, you know, door handles in stores, that type of thing. So, Gordy, in, in terms of the hospital and, you know, just cleaning, you've got crew, <clears throat> excuse me, you've got crews coming in a couple of times a day, you know, high traffic areas are getting wiped down. I mean, I, I think there's a couple of good news messages and it's probably not mentioned as often enough, which is good hygiene does work. You know, just simple hand washing for 20 to 40 seconds with a basic detergent. Um, you know, most disinfectants will kill this virus, this envelope virus on contact, correct? Yeah. So that's what we have in our facility. We have a lot of these dispensers, you know, for sanitizer, where you don't have to touch the surface. They're just automatic. Um, so every time someone comes in before they're screened, we ask them to wash their hands. When, they, when I bring them into the exam room to see them, I ask them to wash their hands. And when they leave, I ask them to wash their hands. So it's almost become sort of a routine. Um, and we have on our desks, you know, Clorox uh, wipes so that I wipe down the chair um, or the exam table if they've been using that in between patients and I take it onto the door handle and I, I'm pretty obsessive with wiping down the phone and computer and light switch as well. So you, it just becomes um, almost like routine. Um, even though it seems a little obsessive, I think it's, you can never do too much hand washing or, or, or sanitization. Um, so this, is, this slide is just showing you what I spoke about earlier. And, and Ian, you were mentioning this too, is that I think the first wave was, was really trying to deal with the morbidity and mortality of COVID. And we didn't really know what to expect. So that's why everything kind of shut down basically to manage that first wave. 
and I think now we're starting to, you know, get into sort of the second wave, which is the impact of the resource restriction on the urgent non-COVID conditions. So obviously certain cancer surgeries and other surgeries now are gonna be the first ones to, to really get going. Um, my patients that I'm really concerned about in terms of their medical histories, I'm really saying, okay, now is the time to start coming. Um, and then the third wave will be this impact of the interrupted care on chronic conditions. So, you know, there's still people that I'm concerned about, but I'm still not really able to bring them into the clinic just yet. Um, but that'll be kind of the third wave. And then the fourth wave is this red graph that's just increasing sort of exponentially, the, the kind of economic impact and mental health and, and psyche, psychological impact and, and the burnout, I think, on, on healthcare providers as well. It, it's all very real. And uh, this is the thing that I'm most worried about. And, and I feel grateful that I have a lot of mental health resources in, in my facility and, and we've been using people quite aggressively. Uh, we do wellness checks so that we were able to identify out of our 50,000 patients in our uh, family health team, we can identify the ones that are, um, have substantial uh, social determinants of health, whether it be poverty, mental illness, addiction, and we reach out to them proactively just to check in and see how they're doing. We even have an income security worker who kind of navigates all these programs through the government, you know, the CERB and the CEWS, um, and, you know, all those programs so that we can help patients navigate what they might be eligible for. And so I'll just finish off talking about the future. And, and uh, Ian, we were talking about this earlier that, uh, and I know you sent a guidance document or, or a document that veterinarians are working on is to say like, we probably won't have as many busy clinics that we used to, right? And, and so I think that we're gonna have to have more flexible work shifts and we're starting to look at a plan where we're gonna open up on Saturday and Sunday and people can come in and do a four hour shift on a Saturday or Sunday. People will be able to do just a four hour block in the evening if they don't wanna be. So the idea is to take people out of the clinic uh, as much as possible and try and spread out how, when we're seeing patients, making sure that we have fewer patient visits. And this is looking sort of way down the road um, because right now we're still limited in who we're able to see. Um, but I think the idea of like a, a huge waiting room, you know, in a hospital is sort of a thing of the past. Uh, I know for you guys, you're doing curbside, right? And, and that obviously there's certain uh, pet owners that don't like that, right? Because they want to be there with their pet. But I think that's going to become more the norm, right? Where you ask people to wait outside, um, especially the people that they're with, because um, you don't want to have uh, so many people coming in. I think there's going to be an emphasis on telemedicine um, for a long time now. This is going to become more the norm and, and phone visits. Um, we're going to obviously have to make sure we have adequate ongoing supply of PPE if this is going to go on for you know months or even possibly years. Um, need for more aggressive testing. So I think that we're starting to finally see testing done more appropriately where more and more people need to be tested, especially if they're out and about working in the, in the public setting. Uh, the question of the role of antibody testing or serology is, is a really good one because right now the technology is not great. Um, and initially people thought, you know, you would demonstrate you have immunity and you would just go about your business and wouldn't be, you know, wouldn't have a problem. But I, I think that's too optimistic. Um, more employees will be working from home. That's for certain. Uh, I know you guys probably go to a lot of conferences right around the world. Uh, you know, and that's always been a big perk of being a vet or, or being a physician. I think those conferences and massive conventions are a thing of the past. I just don't see them happening anytime soon. Um, and I think there'll be less emphasis on just travel in general, work travel and pleasure travel for a little while. But I really think we need to plan for future pandemics, right? Because this, we might get through this and we may get a vaccine in the next year or two. Um, but ultimately, you know, there'll be another pandemic down the road and we have to be prepared because we didn't really learn from SARS, even though we thought maybe we did learn from SARS. We, this shows that we were not ready, uh, especially in the United States. Um, where the number of infections is, you know, and number of deaths is, is really significant compared to other countries. Um, so these are just some of the, the resources I like, World Health Organization, NIH, CDC, Ontario, our province, I think, has done a good job in terms of resources. Uh, City of Toronto uh, is also has a nice website as well. Um, so I don't think we've nailed it, uh, unfortunately. Um, and like I was saying, not to get political, but I think that we need strong leadership through these times. And um, 
there are certain countries that have done really, really well showing what they can do. Like I think New Zealand, is, even though it's a small country, they've done a good job. Sweden is a very controversial question because they're trying to sort of promote herd immunity, which you need about 70 or 80% of the population uh, to get this, to really get to herd immunity. And, uh, and, you know, the thinking is the prevalence in most of these countries is it's about seven to 15%. I think in New York city, it's about 20% of people. Um, and so you have a long way to get to herd immunity and a lot of people will die, I think, before you get to that. Um, but it's a very interesting question, right? Because they've had their economy generally opened and restaurants open. And obviously you don't have the fallout of the mental health burden because they've been open and functioning more normally. So it, it's a really interesting discussion. I'm sure you've all had these discussions uh, with friends and, and family. Um, so uh, I always like to finish <laughs> off the funny, uh, this is more your humor. So true. So but, true, uh, Gordy. Yeah. Yeah. So a, a couple of uh, take home messages. First of all, uh, a very big thank you to Dr. Gordon Arvis for being here with us today. Uh, we're all busy um, and, and he is as well. So thank you uh, most importantly for being here. A couple of just uh, quick notes. Um, the CBMA has been working diligently with uh, folks like Dr. Scott Weiss. Uh, there are a lot of guidance documents um, on multiple provincial websites, uh, on the CBMA website, Scott on his Worms and Germs blog. Um, we haven't spoken a lot about industry and industry interaction, but I can tell you that the Canadian Veterinary Medical Association uh, and uh, the Canadian Animal Health Institute, CAHI, have been working closely together, uh, again, to help some, some, with some guidance documents. But you know, please understand, uh, industry, as well as so many other areas that veterinarians touch upon, we, we understand you know, the pain points that, that you guys are experiencing, and we're, we're obviously here for you. Um, you know, to, to Dr. Arbus's point, I think this is, a, this is a moving target, and that's what makes this very frustrating. I think for the same reason people ran out to feel secure, you know, by buying a lot of toilet paper when the first outbreak occurred, people are looking to, you know, hold on to some solid information. If I do this, you know, this will not happen. And I think that uncertainty creates, um, you know, a lot of, of, of unsettling um, ease, if you will. But I think you know, groups like the CVMA, um, you know, large hospital settings. I mean, I, I do think we're, we're seeing progress uh, through some of these treatments as needed. I think, you know, the fact that so many Canadians didn't have to go on ventilators, I do think we're learning as we go. But that's the whole point. You know, we're recreating the playbook every, every few weeks. And I think that's the part that's making frustrating it. Uh, for so many of us. But again, uh, Dr. Arbus, thank you so, so much. Um, there was a request if we could have your slide presentation, um, that would be that would be great. Many of the of veterinarians were very appreciative of, of, of the, the data and the details. And I think having this uh, this public health forum and, and these kind of comments are just are just really critical for us. So we so appreciate ha having you and, and uh, to everyone be safe. And uh, and I think we'll sign off uh, for now. Thank you so much for having me. Take care, everybody. Take care, guys. Thank you.